Hi, Francis, how are you? Fine, oh, fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, faintly, faintly. Faintly? Yeah, you sound a bit faint. Ah, why? Because uh, it was okay just a while ago. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. You sound great. Is it, is it better? Yes. Hello? Yes, like, uh, yes Prof. I can, can hear you very well. I can hear you very well. Okay. Great. Um, I'd like to, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, webinar on the pathways to attaining the sustainable development goals in Nigeria. We all know the situation we have found ourselves in globally uh, with COVID-19. Nobody says it's going to be over. But the reality before us is that we have to move on as a people and the life must continue, even though, as we say, can you hear me, please? Can you hear me, please? Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you. Now we can't hear you. I lost the signal, so I will take it all over. I want to welcome all of us to this webinar. I hope I can be heard. Uh, Professor Bohari, can you hear me? Uh, well, I can hear you indeed. It's breaking. Okay. Uh, and Dr. Ubanjo, I lost it. Present, sir. And you will listen. Yes, I'd like to welcome Dr. Ubanjo Ubanjo to this webinar. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I can also see Professor Ngozdiaka. Professor Francis Edward. Good afternoon, says Dr. Bani. Uh, Professor Larry Olanio is also connected. 
today and I guess by the number of members and audience. I hope you can hear me. So I was trying to talk about yeah. it's also connected. And I guess by the number of our members are also connected. So I was trying to talk about the reason for this webinar, and it's for us to discuss how we can a uh, professor in the faculty of us uh, university of ibadan uh, he was for several years the director of uh, those were glorious years of odl at the university of ibadan uh, he's also the president of nigerian academy of letters i know so much about him but i'm not going to talk about everything this afternoon about him so we welcome professor buhari also, yes, I would also like to welcome uh, Dr. Udubanjo of the Nigerian Academy of Sciences. He's a public health uh, specialist, a uh, man of many years of experience, and uh, he has been leading a number of programs and projects, and he will also be one of our resource persons here this afternoon. So on behalf of all of us, I'd like to welcome these uh, two gentlemen and scholars. So I turn it over to Professor Ed Bohari. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, have your slides? Yeah, your slides, my slides are there. I think you can share the slides. I ask the technical person to handle that for me. Uh, I hope Femi is uh, hearing me, okay? Uh, yeah, thank you, Femi. Um, yeah, my, I am supposed to be talking on the achieving uh, the SDG in Nigeria to the humanity. And uh, I, I really want to uh, approach this uh, from three parts, uh, having three posts in mind. One is I would like to spell out the underlying principles of sustainable development, uh, even though we are familiar with them as uh, people from the humanity, we always tend to begin with some conceptual issues. Uh, uh, and part of that, we will look at uh, the, the SDGs themselves, I will just browse through there, just there for, because everyone here is uh, familiar with the SDGs. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we will delineate some conceptual issues. Uh, uh, my focus basically are on the conceptual incongruences and disfluences that can, can read, that need to be resolved before we start talking about uh, achieving uh, uh, sustainability and achieving the SDGs. Um, we will, I will emphasize the need for philosophical and ideological clarity. Uh, then, of course, the need for to articulate sustainable development as a national vision and ideology. Uh, because without doing that, we will just be doing emergency and, of course, expending uh, our time and energy without really having a, a, a focus around which everyone can pay attention. Then uh, we will look at the issue of mainstreaming uh, the sustainability into the operational processes. Uh, this I will run through that quickly. Then in order to minimize contradictions and uh, confusion in understandings and implementation, I will also look at uh, the whole idea of uh, raising practical problems that do not support uh, uh, sustainability and sustainable development, uh, especially with the context of Nigeria. I think the, I will then go ahead to focus on the value of uh, the humanity through the centrality of culture and language to development. Uh, the idea that with, without uh, integrating uh, uh, culture, uh, and language, uh, the idea of uh, sustainable development 
will be a problem because the, the issues of participation, the issues of access, the issues of uh, inclusion within a multi-cultural uh, and a multilingual setting becomes a very uh, critical problem. They can raise the uh, issues that uh, are disturbing. Then, of course, uh, I will then zero in on the Nigerian context and some of what may be done by offering practical suggestions involving policies and practice. That basically gives a very brief summary, just in case somebody is having an issue later on uh, and uh, uh, cannot follow uh, the uh, presentation that we, 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 are, we are highlighting here. Uh, so the idea of sustainability uh, is stated right here is the imperatives of the present and uh, the need for the future generation to have them at the back of our mind. And the idea that we must look at, have a common outlook, not just as nations, or as individuals, but come out look at as, as a race, as a, as a human race. Uh, then that gives us a uh, move up to the next issue. Uh, uh, that, I mean, the idea that sustain, sustainable development is, is uh, basically for the future, the present with the, an outlook of the future in mind. Uh, then the framing principles, uh, which I have, uh, I basically this are my own understanding of the framing uh, principles, is the preservation and sustenance of life in all its forms, and then the, the focus on the dignity of the human person. And then, of course, we look at the oneness of the human race, our shared uh, uh, destiny, our shared values, and so on. And then the need to tend and nurture the earth as our duty and responsibility to ourselves and the future generation. Uh, I think these principles are basically to be found in all cultures if we look very closely. I, I think we then move on to the, the next idea, uh, which is uh, the next idea. Uh, I will need to have the next slide uh, Yeah. Uh, we, we don't leave it uh, as to focus on this. It's just for, for us to, when by the time we start looking at solutions, we now focus on these ideas of this uh, SDG. Uh, I just listed them out for there so we can move on uh, without necessarily uh, spending time on this. Um, the, the whole ideas are all in the public space. But we now start with the conceptual challenges. One serious conceptual challenge is the unsustainable ideas of progress and modernity. We are driven in an era where there is a whole single modernity. The whole concept of a single modernity is a problematic which needs to be resolved in terms of the fact that we are looking for, it, it creates a linear idea of development, a linear sense of progress, and then which allows, uh, does not allow communities to look inward, which also undermines the indigenous solution. And then the, the prevalence of economic and political models and systems that are unsupportive of sustainable development, we need to interrogate them. Uh, and then, of course, dissect them and find a way to correct some of these things. Then, culturally and on, uh, environmentally, on supportive, on supportive models of business. Uh, you look at business, for instance, uh, the idea, for instance, uh, of human, of human beings being labor, human beings being resources, uh, in a way, uh, creates subliminal approaches and ideas uh, that create a transactional uh, interrelationship with human beings. That's uh, why we can exploit them and then we merchandise them as well. Uh, then, of course, perception of meaning. There are diversities of perception of meaning, life, being, the cosmos. And they, they impose upon us, even whether we are conscious of it or not, ideologies that enforce or undermine sustainable, uh, sustainability and sustainable development. Yeah, I think then, uh, of course, the, there are antithetical values and mindsets. There are expectation gaps that are created. Uh, one of such expectation gaps is really the idea that uh, production and consumption can be elastic. Uh, this in itself also uh, exposes a lot of countries with uh, difficult issues of uh, environment and so on. So the uh, generational fissures, where people believe that every form of failure or every form of difficulty is because there are some limitations that have been imposed by the leadership. Uh, of course, uh, this also has led to the disruption of indigenous knowledge systems, where even societies that were once very connected with, uh, with, the, with, the, with the environment, like, like some societies, they see the environment as being in at par with the human being in such a way that you have to collaborate with, with beings. Trees are not just trees, trees are, are beings. Uh, and so by, because of this perception of a such environment and the relationship of environment to humanity, uh, the, the, this, uh, this uh, environment is treated more with dignity and respect. Uh, whereas when you look at these as resources, which, which basically has come from a, a particular ideology of how we relate to the environment, exploitation of the environment without caution, uh, in an unconscionable way, becomes very easy to do when the environment is not considered as some being with life that needs to be protected and, and respected. Uh, the projection of success and achievement and heroism are all antithetical in the sense that they create uh, values 
that disconnect, uh, that oppose the sustainability in every diverse ways, and they are called relationship paradigms that promote competition rather than cooperation. We still see, in the context of nations that we today have, where we are competing with, competing with one another, uh, where individuals are in competition, uh, this themselves also creates a problem for sustainability. And then, of course, the definition of wealth. I think we can move on uh, and then uh, this, uh, to the third uh, uh, conceptual issue, uh, which uh, have the practical challenges actually, which have to do with fragmentation of communities, on the resourcing of global wisdom. Uh, basically, we are, we are narrowed down to a particular kind of wisdom. Uh, this is not only in, in terms of the global environment, also in local environment. We, we do not see, for instance, that looking at culturally, the culture of any people is a generation of experience. It, 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 every language, for instance, is an encyclopedia of the people's uh, learned ways and how they have dealt with the environment over ages, how they have overcome uh, problems over ages. Everything is, uh, in other words, cultures and languages are like uh, encod encoding of uh, wisdom, which actually, if we put together and we harness them, we are going to be able to resolve most of the problems that we are facing today. Then the hardening of boundaries uh, between people, communication gaps and ineffective uh, multi-dimensional linkages. And then we basically are seeing a point where we are outsourcing thinking to business. Where basically one of the big tragedies of today is the outsourcing of thinking to business, where the, a lot of what we're doing are not generated by the needs of man in terms of how we understand them with the concept of uh, sustainability. But the consumption, driven by consumption, driven by transactions, and all of these are themselves undermining uh, the whole uh, philosophical foundations and the ideologies that drive sustainability. Of course, there is a widening gap of opportunities. We can then move on also to the second uh, level of particular uh, challenges, which has to do with diminishing fraternity arising from a political system, arising from ideological system, failure of convergence and mutuality, intolerance of the other, rise of nationalism, as you can see today. Uh, there is no other. Uh, experience than COVID-19 to show us, for instance, that this world is not prepared. Uh, we talk about the new norm that is coming. We, we don't talk much about the humbling reality that we basically are running a world that is, that is running out of time. And then uh, that, the, that, that we are running, we are running a, a cultural system today that is no longer driven by the idea that man himself and his environment will need to take priority over every other thing. So the fractious ideologies and philosophies of dominance and control is, is uh, one of the issues that uh, has become a, prat a practical challenge to us. Then extensive trust deficit of government and leadership and the uh, institutions. And if you talk about the issue of fake news, for instance, and you are talking about the issue of uh, uh, conspiracy theory, people don't look at the fact that there is a serious trust deficit, which undermines even the idea of uh, climate, climate change, the, the attacking of climate change, the idea, of, for instance, of, of uh, pushing the ideas of uh, sustainable development. I think we should move on so that uh, we can uh, now move practically to the adaptation, adaptational challenges, disruptions and perpetual disorientation. If we come to the micro level to the individual, technologies are creating challenges for the individuals themselves, not only society, inequalities in society, but also more for the individuals who have no time to digest technologies before they change. And uh, of course, to also situate themselves within technology. Uh, what we just see basically is that uh, uh, we, we, we are being disrupted. Personal lives are being disrupted. Disintegrated social and political ideologies are arising. Generational shifts and value dissonances. And then, of course, violence and population movement. All of these are evidence, for instance, that man is in search of uh, a direction, in search of understanding. And if we want to look at and preserve that understanding, we can see it back if we reconnect with who we are and even reconnect with our environment. We are going to find a lot of solutions to this and give stability to man. So the whole idea of sustainable development is not just about uh, preserving the environment. It is also sustaining the human life and giving stability to man as a human being and helping him to understand exactly what it means to be human. Uh, the structure of local ec ecology, uh, language and cultural endangerment, death and perpetual uh, disorientation and displacement are some of the things that the average human being is facing today. Now, let's look at even the question of communication flows and chan uh, channels. There is a widening cycle of meanings and understanding. And if I may give you the examples from inside, from a, a lot of, uh, from, from Nigeria environment, for instance, the number of languages we have, the number of cultures, the diminishing competencies that people have, in, even in the foreign language, English that we're using, the diminishing competencies in local languages. There is no language and culture enable, enable us to build convergences, to reach understanding, to have commonalities of meaning, 
In other words, each one of the 200 million people are, uh, of us here, we have our own perception of reality and understanding, but we are moderated by our world is moderated by our cultures and our languages so that we can reach some level of convergence. But when these things are, these uh, 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 heritages are desiccated, then we have wide, widening circles of meaning and understanding. We reduce the cycle to such a way at a personal level and create a lot of crisis within society. Peace is fundamental, for instance, for sustainability. Inadequate framework for effective communication. Inadequate aggregation and integration of indigenous knowledge systems are also part of it. Poor local language content in what we do uh, is uh, part of it because language in itself, delivered by technology, has no sentiment. It is, it is, a, it is the biggest cause of genocide today. Uh, if you look at cultural decays and as, as, as genocide, that when languages are delivered by, with true technology and so on, and when cultural content is delivered to technology, there is no question for accommodation. You simply have the overthrow and over a superimposition of one culture on the, on, the, on the globe. Diversity is the way of nature. So when we lose our, and, and language and culture enable us to see exactly what diversity means, and how we have benefited from different views of the world over a period of time, over millions of years of experience. But when this is lost, we diminish in the capacity of the human person to be able to get the best out of, a, of, a, of, a, of a the system. Part of the problem of communication through our channels is that even the, the interpretation of science and the, and the percolation of scientific discoveries to the human population now is becoming a challenge uh, because you, you are now having more and more gaps between science and the benefits of science on the people. And then, of course, uh, like, I, like I have mentioned somewhere, it is, uh, this communication challenge is throwing even more problems even to the media itself. Then there's the intervention mindset when we are intervening, which is predatory and opportunistic opportunistic and uh, is, is a source of positive of uh, uh, the, the sustainability. Now, we need to replace this with a conventional mindset, uh, in which case, rather than just enter, in, entering into communities and offering them solutions, and of course, uh, then disappearing, we need to build a, 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 a bottom-up approach where the communities themselves are part of the whole business of uh, interpretation. Uh, everything is about meaning and interpretation. So we need to be able to empower communities to provide mean, their mean, the meaning and to provide their interpretation. So that, then that takes us to the next uh, 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 issue, um, the, the humanities. I don't need to go into this. It's such a wide area. Uh, they, they, it has to do with what it means to be human. Anything that studies what it means to be human. Uh, and I just made a list uh, of, of that. We, need, we shouldn't waste, waste time on that. Let's move on to the next. Uh, to the next slide, uh, the culture and language are central to sustainable development. Because cultures and language deal with knowledge systems, they deal with ideological currents and movements. They are the basis for creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship, and their cultural connections. It shapes, because we, we, we are basically shaped by our language, we are shaped by our culture, and the organizing principle of society is provided by culture. And then language and culture are necessary for economic development. Uh, and this has been proven in so many ways because the cultural economy in itself, again, when you disrupt a cultural economy, you create a problem. When you have a problem of inclusion, you create a problem of poverty. When, when you begin to, uh, to deal with the uh, desiccate culture, you are creating a problem for adaptation, human adaptation. Language and cultures contain the value system. And they, call the basis, they are the basis of power and domination, access and participation. They are the, they are the foundation for identity and group membership. Effective healthcare provision also underlies our understanding, for instance, of uh, the, 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 the way societies have handled healthcare. For instance, pandemics are not new to even our society, but we, we need to be able to aggregate information, find out exactly what are the, how have these been coded in our cultures, how have these been coded in our history, how have they been coded in the language, what are the terminologies, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, scientific, scientific and technology development are also founded on the basis of culture because uh, uh, science and culture and technology do not uh, exist in abstraction. They exist within a scientific, uh, within a cultural context. Then of course, the quality of education. It is, has been proven, for instance, that to, for people to have a good education, education they need to uh, be exposed to uh, education in their, their native, in their mother tongue. And uh, this, the, the, the research has shown this over and over again. So what, is the, what are the imperatives for humanistic action? One, a conceptualization of sustainability and sustainable development that is concrete and clear. A vision of state that articulates it with clarity. 
the governance framework and parameters for measuring progress, the governance architecture that integrates ideas, principles, regulations, and reward systems that are congruent, and then an education system that maximizes the opportunity. And then, of course, ideologies and philosophies of life and environment that is congruent with the uh, sustainability and sustainable development. Then uh, that moves us to the next uh, imperative local adaptation of the vision through symbols and means that speak to the realities of the gravitating unit. A worldview that aligns with the principles of sustainability, fundamental principles of culture that are supported, relationship paradigms that are congruent, lifestyle that is congruent with sustainable development. Because if your lifestyle is sending a different message, the lifestyle that is supported by the system is sending a different message as the global system is today, then of course you and I will destroy this, the, 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 the world before we know it. Socializing institutions that incorporate parameters that are supported. Unfortunately, one of the things that we do basically is that we still work with paradigms of uh, socializing institutions, influence of institutions, without necessarily looking at the nature of the state. We have to look at the nature of the state to know which institutions are, are dominant in the state. Not We create institutions after the colonial uh, uh, structure. We assume that those institutions are the inflation ones. We create NGOs, CBOs, and so on and so forth. But indeed, the uh, parameters that we use in evaluating their, their influence on society are really way out of the data, if you look at the exact nature of the state. The languages that encode and empower sustainable thinking. What can you talk about sustainability and sustainable development without even the language in itself to conceptualize it, to have a, the worldview? Because it is the language that enables us, enables us to reduce the ideas in such a frame, to such a system, in which we can think about them, rationalize, create, and to now begin to develop the, the whole the society along that line. And then communication channels and systems that entrench it. These are the, the, the imperatives for humanification. Now let's go on to intervention cluster. Now what I'm trying to do here basically is that it is impossible for us to look at every area in humanities where interventions can, can be made and how they can be made. And it, that we should base our interventions on, on policies and principles, and then of course uh, action, rather than simply making a list. Now what I have done basically is look at the, uh, the culture. We need to do sustainable development mapping. Now, one of the things I'm saying is that we can use technology today to do some level of mapping if we do a, a, sustainable, sustainable, a sustainability matrix, sustainable development matrix, uh, where we aggregate all cultural practices within a certain kind of para defined parameters that we can look at in terms of cultural parameters that are supportive and that they negate, behavioral tendencies that are supportive and negate, and find a way to allocate them to certain areas. Let me just give you one concrete example. Suppose we do the protein habits of people all over the country, Nigeria, and we realize that uh, uh, there are certain kinds of uh, uh, wildlife that are consumed in uh, my village, for instance, say maybe like the cane rat. And then there is, a, and then we have to map everywhere a cane rat is contributed. We have a GIS mapping where all of these things are, are, are aggregated. We can flag when there is a health crisis, and we know that the cause of the health, do not disease is from cane rat. We can immediately start and flag everywhere we look at rats are consumed. And we can do this for all, as many, as many, from health issues to language issues to educational and so on and so forth. And then we have ready information before we enter into deep narrative of causes and effects. Then conceptualizing and adapting the, uh, the SDGs, uh, articulating a coherent and clear SD uh, vision in collaboration with communities, aligning cultural troops with national vision. One, one, what, what, what I'm saying here basically is that there are truths in every culture. It is no use in a multicultural place like Nigeria for you to have a national SDG that are undigested, that have not been uh, dissected and, uh, and uh, owned by society themselves, where you put all kinds of things in the, in the budget and in national speeches and so on. But the people can have, no, have no clue of what's going on. They strengthen congruent truths and demonstrate the effects of negative truths on communities. Now, uh, and then we can move on. Now, let's look at specific Nigerian issues as I begin to, to, uh, to round up. You see, people don't understand that we, we have a, 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 there are two major problems in Nigeria today that are uh, affecting uh, sustainability. One is the widening cycle of unity and understanding as a result of the desiccation of languages. The second is the issue of uh, mismanagement of diversity. We have receding lingua franca. The lingua francas are no longer performing as lingua franca. There is a crisis of the language and endangerment and language death. We can't go into the meeting. There is a fossilization of indig indigenous languages, in which case, the indigenous languages are no longer able to perform the functions of the modern man. 
In other words, you have a language that is uh, about uh, 200 years uh, behind in terms of the, the mod mo what the modern man needs to survive. Then de-bilingualization of Nigeria. We used to talk about the average Nigeria being a bilingual. We are gradually lo losing that today. The hardening of ethnic boundaries, rise of Nigerian pidgin and associated ideology. Uh, then, of course, there's the problem of limited English proficiency, which is also undermining our capacity to, uh, to converge in terms of even using the English language. Because every, almost every community now has its own version of English language and the meaning, because what they do basically is translate. And so that in itself is creating misunderstanding and creating crisis, creating suspicion, uh, in, uh, and, and of course affecting the governance uh, capacity and, uh, and so on. Then the growing lot of proficiency has mentioned that. And then uh, I think we can then move on to the, the, the next uh, slide. And uh, uh, then, cultural and linguistic, then I, I talk about diversity management. The information is there 250 ethnic groups and over 500 languages, segregated urban settlement patterns, internal migrations and displacement of persons, violence and resource war, growing insecurity, uh, and then, of course, challenges of inclusion. All of these are examples of the fact that we have focused on diversity as a problem, not as a resource. When we see that diversity is the way of nature, we will now see uh, diversity as a resource. And when managed properly by, by, by people and by their government, you see that, first of all, we can catalyze productivity. We can, we can minimize poverty because we can disaggregate investment in such a way that every community in itself is thriving because we have something to offer. Because what we have to offer are knowledge, knowledge capsules, knowledge bits, knowledge uh, content, and which the world is hungry for. So we need to be able to offer this. And it's the true good diversity management that will do that. So one of the policies that I will even, in fact, uh, look at for is a policy on diversity management. We don't have a policy on diversity management. And uh, let's move on, please, uh, to the ne ne next uh, slide. Yeah. The, the, the issue of diminishing productive capacity. People don't understand why it appears as if every effort that is made by government is not yielding results. It's because we, have, we are experiencing a rapid dimi uh, 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 diminishing productive capacity. One is because we are offering education to people in a language that is not read to them. And so uh, we know that education is best delivered, even as, at least at the basic level, in the mother tongue, uh, in order to bring the reality to the people in the way they can understand best. There's the burden of obsolescence and, uh, and ineffective use of local languages that is also undermining our innovations and creativity. And then because indigenous languages are the foundation of abstract, critical, innovative, and creative thinking and productive learning. We have a funny uh, idea of science and development as if it precludes humanity. But the truth basically is that there are even language problems in, in mathematics. And uh, we need to be able to understand the connections between creative thinking, productive learning, innovative, innovative innovation, and culture and language until we are able to integrate that. The truth is that we are not going to be able to leverage on our human capacity in order for us to, be, to break the barriers that are before us. Now, one of the things that is very obvious to us now is the poor achievement in science at, at, the, basic, and, and basic, at the basic education level. Uh, this is related to the use of English in formative years. And I have one story I always say that the reason I was a very good in, in uh, mathematics, but at the secondary school level, I left because of the, of the language problem of simultaneous situation. I was asked to so two x plus three y is equal to what? And I said, what is x and y? They say x and y are variables. What is variables? I, 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 didn't, I don't understand what the variable is. He says now one orange plus two banana is equal to what? I said, I was thinking of juice, how you can get juice from uh, orange and banana. And uh, the, the, the teacher was thinking of something else. So, so, I, so I was wondering, are you going to crush them? and uh, put them together and so on. So you can see, there are so many examples of this that I, I, if I, I can spend one hour to, 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 to give you more and more examples of this. Uh, I think there was one again that somebody says uh, seven minus three is equal to, seven plus three is equal to 10. Uh, it says five plus five is equal to 10. Uh, the boy now says, uh, if everything is equal to 10, then there must be lying in this school. And in fact, it's in. That and seven plus, plus three is because he did not understand the basic uh, principles of the addition, which is presented to him in the local language, which he understands first, which some of us were exposed to in the primary school, which we attended those days. We didn't have problem with, uh, with addition. We didn't have problem with mathematics as well, because it was already to us. So, and the point basically is that English is not well adapted to, com to communicate local values and ideology, while information encoded in foreign language are not properly digested. So the finality of all this is the lack of confidence associated with the use of 
for, for, for the foreign language. And we need to deal with all of these things as a matter of the national priority. So what are the critical questions? How do we communicate development to the diverse uh, uh, and uh, 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 language groups, illiterate, uh, rural and urban populations in a sustainable and participative way? How do we empower them to take advantage of and contribute to local and global knowledge resources? How do we facilitate the preservation and development of uh, and uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, utilization of the of the and cultural legacy? Then that leads us to again. Uh, uh, can we move on, please? And then, I, so this leads us to action points. These are the points that we need to the description, documentation, modernization, and transmission of indigenous languages and cultures that will promote use and transmission of local languages, that will integrate local languages and cultural content with information communication technology, that will empower teachers to take pride in their languages and cultures, that will foster integration and national consciousness, and that will promote national development and global competition. I have resided into this, I have written books on, in, a, in this area of language, business, and economic development. And, I, and one of the things that we are doing very well, unfortunately criticizing, is the fact that the cultural industry is probably one of the fastest growing in Nigeria today. Religion, for instance, is an aspect of the cultural industry. Why we feel the religion, but we are failing to also look at the, the cultural, the, the, the investment dimension, the business dimension as well, and the service as a service and motiv motivational sector in the uh, motivational industry in the service sector. If we look at it more only strictly within the narrow spiritual uh, section, we, 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 we undermine and forget about the economic value of what is going on in the tourism, impact of tourism, local and international and so on. So, what do we do? Culturally and linguistically sensitive interventions are required. Resourcing indigenous wisdom is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a mandatory. Elevating awareness and connection to the environment. Unfortunately, because of colonialism, we desecrated our, our, our understanding of, a, of a, the environment, of nature. I grew up in a society where you, you could not defecate around the river, you could not cut down a tree around the river, because the trees had their spirit. Now, when we look at them as fetish, fetish uh, understanding, what the people were trying to do, basically, is to create a connection with the environment in order for people to dehumanize the environment. So that when you look at the environment as a being, it is more difficult for you to desecrate and destroy it. And so the whole ideology of that was totally mis misunderstood by, by the colonial masters. And unfortunately today, we are being reversed and returned back to that era that was uh, said to be backward, where Africa was supposed to be cool. And I need to raise the, the, the information that we are driven too much by material, by material understanding of life, success, and so on. That in itself creates a fundamental problem to sustainable development because we, he, 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 man will live as if the resources of the earth are in, uh, cannot be exhausted. It's elastic. And that in itself, I believe that is an ideology that we have to, to deal with. We have to mainstream sustainable thinking as a culture. Entrenching sustainable development mindset through curricular and content across all levels of education uh, that we affect leadership definition, that we incorporate management processes, that we revision concepts and definition of success and power, and the reward system, interrogating values of heroism. Those issues are very critical, and these are the things that humanity can do through literature, through art, through a uh, reward system. And then identifying culturally relevant institutions for integration into intervention framework. In every religion, there are elements in every religion that incorporate sustainable thinking. We are not, in fact, projecting them. We are not looking at them as opportunities, for instance, to entrench, even within the framework of the adherence of those religions, the idea of sustainability and sustainable development. Modeling of theories. The humanities need to come out now to model theories, economic theories, political theories that are congruent with the demands of sustainable development. We cannot continue to perpetuate the same theories that have taken the earth to where it is and assume that things are going to change by simply carrying out mechanical actions. We have to change the man in order to change his, uh, his uh, outlook. We change his outlook, we change his environment. We change his environment, we are assure his future. Then is defining and disseminating purposes. Finding symbolisms and values that align and project, and, uh, uh, project uh, we can project through popular culture and media and modernizing and adapting relevant traditional symbolism through scientific truth and new forms of media. Now, a lot of what we call juju uh, and, uh, and fetish in there, uh, we can modernize them by the truth scientific truth. By trying, and this is one of the things that Nigeria Academy of Letters is trying to do. 
when you create, for instance, uh, the technology, for instance, you convert them and align them with, uh, for instance, new uh, scientific te 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 technology. The whole idea of quantum entanglement, for instance, is also you can understand that also from the the the, the, the cosmogony of many African societies. In, in fact, you will see that there is depth in our in our thinking in the African uh, uh, tradition and religion. If we are not afraid to break barriers and boundaries, and then find scientific truth. Because the modern man is a scientific man and a scientific mind. So let's go on, please. Okay. We have to narrow the cycle of meanings. I think I don't need to waste time on this again. And uh, develop, we have to develop framework for harnessing culture. Uh, Tying indigenous language to sports, for instance, one, one way to do that. Mapping cultural areas, I've said, talked about that. Uh, then I think we cannot move away from there are two critical issues that I, uh, three critical issues that, I, and after that, I think I will run with. That's the developing mandate for higher education institutions, which refers to sustainable development goals in specific humanity areas. No higher institution in Nigeria should be left without a specific mandate with benchmark uh, uh, timelines and uh, with uh, so on to determine exactly. To give them this mandate in their own area, we will be that within a few years, we'll cover the whole of Nigeria and we'll change the thinking, we we'll change the perspective. And then, of course, we have to prom promote uh, the language and cultural business because that's the only way the rural area will benefit from uh, the growing uh, knowledge economy. And then, uh, granting free licenses to rural radio stations so that the people there can begin to uh, get involved in, uh, in, uh, in the digital economy. Uh, and, and we can't do that without the investing in uh, the rural uh, connectivity. Uh, internet connectivity. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's move on until I can round up quickly. Uh, so the conclusion, uh, which you see there, the happiest people on earth, and uh, through wisdom, the house is built, and, and by understanding, it's established, and by knowledge, the rooms are filled with all pressures and pleasantries. Uh, my, my, my hope is that uh, if we do all the right things that we need to do, we will share this uh, earth, live on earth as long as possible, and be a happy people with a realistic uh, understanding of what life is about. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you so very much, uh, Francis. You were right on the nick of time, uh, 1.43. I know if we gave you two more hours, you would speak. <laughs> but let's leave it at that. Thank you so very much. Um, now, we have looked at uh, attaining sustainable development goals from the uh, perspective of humanities. We will turn the mic over to Dr. Banji Odubanjo, the Executive Secretary of uh, Nigerian Academy of Science, uh, to let us have the scientific perspective. Over to you, Dr. Odubanjo. Okay. Um, good, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, all. I'm wondering if I can get to share my screen. Um, so I'll do. That, if you don't mind, just a moment. Sorry, so that I, I don't have to start asking to change the slides. Can I just share my screen instead? I think Femi is sharing ease, and that means I have to be depending on you to change them. But okay, so maybe just to save time. Thank you very much, sir, Professor Popola. Thank you for. Uh, the opportunity. Thank you for the, thank you to the network uh, for the privilege of speaking here this afternoon. Uh, I consider it a privilege, and I thank you very much for the invite. Um, it's good. I'm speaking on leveraging scientific evidence, as you can see, to achieve the SDGs in Nigeria. And uh, the correct name is Dr. Oladoyo Dubanjo. Actually, not what is on the uh, screen by my you know by my video as it were, it's a lot of you do banjo, really. And um, as Professor Ibokari, President NAL, has uh, already forewarned, I will not be speaking about the X, the Y, or variables, really. Uh, I'm basically going be, to be looking at, you know, these sustainable goals that we have, these 17 goals. Uh, they are more or less uh, an offshoot of the initial Millennium Development Goals, which ended in 2015, which were not fully achieved. 
and uh, and then ultimately people felt let's set new goals because they felt that this the MDGs really propelled the world as policy statements uh, to run towards development. Uh, however, there, there was now a selectivity war with everybody considering that look, life has so many parts. The MDGs were largely health centered, uh, but people felt there were so many more things that we needed to have goals for uh, as a good reach uh, policy statement than we all should be driving towards. So there are now 17. Somebody complained and said when there were only uh, eight goals, we couldn't remember them. Now they are giving us 17. How do we remember these 17? But it's not about memorizing them. They're always available on the internet. Uh, but it's all about sustainability uh, and it's about development. And basically, I think we can go to the next slide. So basically what I'll be looking at is how you take science actually to influence uh, policy in that direction of sustainable development. So not really the core science, I'm not talking core science, but I'm looking at uh, where we have the science to policy gap, which is a major issue. I think that there's so much more science than we have seen influence the policies that we have made, uh, whether in formulation or in implementation. So it's within that gap, that science to policy gap that my whole talk this afternoon centers on. And I think that's what fits very much into the topic that I've been asked to speak on, which is how do you use the science to influence it? So basically what it takes to achieve the SDGs is that we'll need the scientific evidence and advice to so support the successful delivery of those goals. And that requires action at many levels. Basically the, the, um, the job or the crucial role of the scientific community is to provide evidence, expertise and data uh, that will underlie or form the foundation, uh, inform and help to monitor the implementation of these 17 goals. So you need the science uh, to help inform uh, where you're going, how to get there, and also monitor if you're even getting there. You know, how close are you to the goal? Uh, when you get to the goal, how would you know? So you need science to define some of these uh, parameters and give you the data necessary. However, the process of translating evidence or scientific evidence, if you wish, into policy, uh, whether formulation or implementation is not very straightforward. So basically, I'll be talking all around those issues. So when we look at science and policy making, and the, the assumption is that when governments uh, have well-developed evidence, then they can make very good decisions, which I think is the general wish that we all have. So it's not enough to have a goal. There are many more decisions. So we have those goals, but there are many more policy decisions to be made that will get us towards those goals. So we assume that when the government has evidence, then they can actually make very good decisions. Uh, secondly, uh, we, 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 we look at it that virtually every challenge that the government has to deal with has a scientific dimension. Whether we have really we have seen that or looked at it and understood that or not, there is a scientific dimension to it. Uh, and thirdly, is to realize that science alone does not make policy. So there are many considerations, values, uh, politis political considerations that go into policy making. Um, science and policy making are very different cultures. They have different cultures, uh, methods, and philosophies. Okay, the nature of the interaction is influenced by context. And, um, you know, culture is influenced by history, by relationship between science and society. I'll give you an example. I, I mean, I have a medical background uh, of what happened. And I'm trying not to talk about COVID outbreak correctly so that that's not uh, uh, quoted or used to the current situation. But again, I was a bit involved with the Ebola outbreak we had uh, in 2014. And for instance, we knew the science was that the bodies, the dead bodies, of, of Ebola patients were actually more infectious than the person when this person is alive. So the bodies, you really don't want people to touch or get near at all, except people who are trained and properly protected. Uh, and perhaps even one of the best things you, you would wish on a good day, for instance, would be cremation. But you can't just do those kind of things uh, without the cultural considerations. Uh, but there's even the faith of some that as regards burials, how there are certain rituals that need to be conducted. So a lot of 
negotiations and interactions have to take place with people uh, and with certain leaders of, of religion or uh, sex to say, look, this is what is going on. Uh, and this is the problem we have. The, the bodies are going to be worse off than the real people. So how do we deal with it? The science says this, uh, but this is the danger. So how would you advise? What would you suggest? You know, so the nature of interaction is always influenced by many things, including context, culture, uh, and history. And uh, there's a place of societal values is uh, in, in science and policy making. So how these interactions will operate then depend on how you frame your intent uh, or how the different parties frame their in intent. Again, it's good to talk about what evidence really is because to the politicians and policymakers, it's as wide as tradition, anecdotes, uh, indigenous knowledge, belief, uh, or and the formal science. However, the, the key thing is that science is defined by processes that uh, the aim is to enhance objectivity so that whatever uh, A sees is what B will also see and come to the same conclusion. So if I were talk about uh, the repeatability of you know, of scientific studies. If you do something here, somebody should be able to do the same thing and get the same results that you get. You know, so, but in, in, uh, it's important to know that there are certain value judgments that, that also lie within science, uh, such as what question, what do you want to really study? Uh, and also, it's important to know that in policy, uh, there's always the question of the sufficiency and the quality of science. And I think the COVID-19 thing really tells us that kind of story where everybody's wondering, you know, okay, they say this now, then they come back tomorrow and say that. So uh, there are always the issues of the sufficiency, the quality and the sufficiency of the evidence that you have. So science advice, which is basically what I'm talking about, is that process, uh, structures and institutions through which governments and politicians consider science, technology, innovation, information in policy and decision making. So it's that process whereby you uh, can cover that science to policy divide. That's how you can leverage science into uh, in achieving the SDGs is by what we call science advice. You know, so that's the process, the structures and institutions that help you to take the science into uh, policy making. And in that system, uh, in the science advice ecosystem, we have several players. You know, whether individual academics, uh, universities, or you talk about the government employed scientists uh, or scientists that exist in many of our agencies, or the science academies like the Nigerian Academy of Science, uh, or I mean, even the parliamentary uh, that's the National Assembly for us in Nigeria. You know, that we in those parliamentary um, bodies you have actual research uh, units whose job also, they, in there also, they will also have certain scientists to advise them. Next please. So the science advice ecosystem is rich and full of several people. So um, what does it take, you know, to uh, get the global goals by 2013? And I think this is taking us back, I'm sorry. Next slide, please. I think I've, I've dealt with this one. You went backwards. Okay. So basically the rational process of uh, policy making, you know, so we're talking about the fact that it's not usually that straightforward. Yes, you want to move science to policy uh, and that sounds great, but it's not exactly that uh, straightforward. The rational thing you expect is that you identify a problem uh, and set goals and values and objectives. Then you look at all the different ways of dealing with that problem. Then you look at the consequences of all your alternative options of, of dealing with it or solutions. Uh, you look at the consequences of those solutions uh, and then you select the best one, you know. Uh, but again, <laughs> things are not that rational in the real world. You don't get that luxury of going just steadily from phase one to phase two. Okay, carry on. I think for some reason you are going back. Carry on, sorry, I passed all this. Sorry, move on. Okay, good, back, back one step. No? 
back again. Okay, so I think just to check, go back one slide. Yes, no, go back one slide again. I think you've you skipped. Go back again. Sorry, go back again. I think I... Okay, I think I just carried on. So I wanted to share my, my screen instead so I can control it myself. Um, okay, so that's the rational process of policy making. Go forward. Please, hello, please go forward. Okay, all right, okay, so let's take off from here. No, go back please for me. Sorry, I think you are changing them too fast. Maybe, okay, just hold on there. So certain things to note is that uh, policymakers oftentimes have limited um, uh, flexibility and uh, very often they have to jump at problems to deal with them very quickly. Uh, the policy cycle, which is almost like what I just gave you in the rational process, is becoming very short. So those you, going through identifying problems, the options and all that, uh, you don't have the luxury of much time. It's becoming shorter and shorter and decisions have to be made faster. Uh, very often we find that the relevant science is incomplete. And sometimes a lot of things are ambiguous, so the answers are not very clear uh, to the policymaker. He's looking at it and he's saying, "Look, I don't have the answer I want." Uh, they are, they can't be expected, you know, to be the scientific reference. That is that you you put these things in journals and all that, and the policymaker is expected to know a, quite a lot of the medicine, understand the uh, mathematics, understand the. Uh, geography understand so it's it can be pretty complicated and they can be the ones to interpret all of those things uh, so they they also see uh, the scientific evidence as just one of the inputs but scientists on the other hand are very good at problem definition uh, but less so at finding workable scalable meaningful solutions or let's just call it practical solutions so they can tell you yes we have all of this but <laughs> it's the, the after speaking, the policymaker says, okay, what do I do with what he has said? You know, um, they often approach with a lot of uh, hubris or jargon. So it's a lot of scientific talk that is difficult to understand. Uh, they fail to consider the many different domains that go into policy formulation, uh, but yet they have a critical role in the policy process. Okay, so carry on. Next slide, please. So basically where that ended is to say that policy is really determined just by the evidence, just by the science, uh, even though it should be informed. So uh, there's a rapidly developing field of evidence to uh, policy, I mean, evidence informed policy making. We used to call it evidence-based policy making, uh, but the terminology is changing to evidence informed policy making in order to highlight the fact that it's not just the scientific evidence that goes into it, but many other things. So the many other inputs uh, would include public opinion. So whether we rightly, we, whether we agree with it or not, but these are all, all inputs that go into policy making. You know, so public opinion, ideology, uh, the electoral contract. So sometimes you get all of the science, but the uh, policy maker decides I can't do that you know, just that way because I need to win the next election. If I do it that way, I, would, I won't win it. You know, so again, the scientists need, need to understand that, uh, but there are many issues that go into policy making, not just the science. So what you want to achieve is ensure that the science is considered uh, in order for the policy to be made properly. So the primary function is ensuring that the policy community understands complex systems. So you want to break down complex issues, complex systems, 
and help the policy making community to understand what is involved. So you're looking at SDGs and all that. Uh, it's not enough to plot graphs or come up with modeling and algorithms. You want them to understand what exactly is at stake and exactly what these things mean. You want to break it down to the uh, simplest possible things that you can explain uh, to them. And then you want to help us, I mean, you want, you want to assist in defining the options that may be available based on the science. Okay, next I think you're covering this slide or something. Good, so uh, other considerations, you understand your audience, uh, you look at the questions and answers. Very often we talk about the demand and supply sides. The demand side is with a scientist or an institution like the Academy of Science, and what answers are you bringing? Is that uh, aligned with what the policy makers are looking for? So again, we often talk about researchers who are just publishing uh, to avoid perishing. And yet they are saying, look, whatever research you are doing should ideally be solving a problem that needs to be solved in the real world. So you should be, there should be some kind of communication whereby you know what the policy makers or the decision makers are trying to deal with and then the research is targeted towards solving those problems or providing answers for that. Uh, we also talk about understanding brokerage versus advocacy. So you are there to broker uh, the truth, but not particularly there to just take a stance on one particular viewpoint that you would not let go of. Uh, and we should have uh, balanced sentences of issues. You should be able to analyze the stakeholders. Sorry, go back, please. Okay, so let's, let's talk about it. the heart of science advice, like I said, and three principal things I pick up on is one, trust. So in order to get that done, um, okay, so let me see, can I, no, I can share my own screen. Sorry, I think the slide is gone. Uh, is anybody seen that? Okay, so in the heart of science advice, uh, three principal things. This uh, uh, that the scientist or the uh, the player in that ecosystem needs to know is to is that th th there is a need to build trust, you know, with the different audiences. Uh, there's need for humility and, like I said, understanding brokerage and not necessarily advocacy among other things. Next slide, please. And uh, the skill set, and out of all the you know, many different skill set, I'll talk about the third one there, uh, which is that we need to know that in the current world, if we're going to inform things like the SDGs and help achieve them, uh, we must know that it goes beyond, you cannot, you have to have a multidisciplinary approach. Okay, so I'm, I'm thankful that uh, the president of the Academy of Letters is here, uh, but we must have a multidisciplinary approach to solving the problems and to informing uh, the policies that we are faced with. We cannot go by single disciplines alone. It doesn't work. Uh, we've had vaccines, for instance, for many diseases for many years, uh, yet we are battling the same diseases. For polio, it's taken us up to 2020 in Nigeria to be declared free of polio. Uh, and the, the, the issues we were faced with were not the lack of a vaccine, uh, but there were social cultural issues and barriers that needed to be overcome. So these are things that scientists need to understand that we are looking beyond single disciplines and that it's important to have good communication skills. Uh, one of the big issues generally in ensuring that science informs policies such as SDGs is that scientists tend to speak in ways that nobody understands them. You know, and one of the things that we have been trying to do over time is get scientists to begin to communicate clearly, uh, whether in what they write uh, or in their speaking. Understand that when they do in the real world, the people who are listening and who are the policy makers and decision makers may not necessarily be from the same field. So they won't understand what you are saying, except it is simple and clear. And then it becomes implementable. Thank you. Next slide. 
So looking towards 2020, 2030, uh, the communities of research policy and practice uh, now focus on questions of how to improve uh, provision of communication and application of scientific evidence to meet global challenges. In this, the stakes are high and the situation is complicated by intensifying debates at the interface that I've spoken about of science and public policy. And that's, the, so I'm, I'm going to talk about some of those challenges at that interface. So one, we have post-truth sentiment. So one of the challenges we're faced with now is the challenge of post-truth sentiment, which includes things like fake news. You know, I know it's popularized by President Donald Trump, uh, but fake news was before he, he became president and fake news continues to be. You know, you get many things now that are coming to you and they just need to be double checked, you know, really double checked all of the time. Even with COVID-19, for instance, many people get many things circulated to them on WhatsApp and what have you. Some of them written as something that really happened. A bad occasion to ask one or two people, do you know the person? You know, they did really happen and they couldn't answer me. And I said, you have to be careful with what you get, you know, because there is a lot of fake news. Uh, the intention uh, for writing it and putting it out there is best known to the authors, but it exists, it's real, it's a current challenge for science. There is also the anti-intellectualism, and I've had many people now who say, you know what, I don't care about experts. You know, the experts don't know anything. So the sentiments are coming up and there are challenges for science today. Uh, now also everyone has an opinion because of Google. Everyone is an expert. Everyone has read uh, and Googled something and they all can tell you, no, no, that's not what it is. You know, COVID-19 doesn't do that, it does this. You know, and you're like, really, when did you become an expert in this? But it's been written uh, on the internet. The ability to differentiate what is right from what is wrong, uh, it doesn't necessarily know. Uh, so that those are, for instance, now the challenges of post-normal science as we speak about it but he doesn't know. So for instance, even WHO had to reverse itself, saying that we were going in one direction and says, no, we can't go in that direction anymore uh, because a study they based it on was faulty. You know, so how much more for the general public to be trying to play some of those roles? Next slide, please. So science advisors have to be honest brokers at the end of the day, uh, which is to tell us what is known uh, what is the expert consensus, what the experts generally believe. Uh, and also it's important that they tell us what is not known, you know, which is what when people write their studies and their research papers, they tend to put limitation of the study. You know, and that's an important component to be able to say, uh, this is something we really don't know. I've seen a paper done uh, on the current crisis where I had to ask the authors and I said, well, fundamentally what you wrote is based on some fundamental, I mean, on data that is fundamentally flawed, you know, and I hope you highlight that very much, you know, very strongly, that there is a fundamental flaw in the data you are using for this, because otherwise, uh, if, if people perceive any part of it to be untrue, they may throw away the old truth, the, or the remaining of the truth that are there. So, uh, I mean, science advisors have to be honest brokers, and they also have to, among other things, be able to tell you options and trade-offs. So basically, um, I've spoken from two, two worlds, you know, I've spoken from two worlds, from um, the world of the Nigerian Academy of Science, where I'm executive secretary, and the academy is a science advisor in that sense. Um, and I've also spoken as the chair of the International Network for Domain Science Advice in Africa, and uh, which is also a body, but a body that helps to build capacity for science advisors. So the, the, the academy, uh, was founded in 77, just to give you an, uh, an example of the academy as I begin to round up. Uh, was founded in 1977 with 42 foundation fellows. Uh, primarily its activities are advisory activities and also the growth and the development of science. And under those ones, there are different uh, projects and, and activities that take place. But the primary things that are done are advisory activities that is activities that aim at this science advice that I'm talking about, moving science uh, from policy, from uh, just the scientific world into policy to ensure it impacts on the real world uh, and ensuring the growth and development of science. Next slide. So I'll give you a few examples as I close. 
uh, this this was 2009 where the academy uh, did induct the president of the country as the grand patron of science in a bid to ensure that the president uh, begins to pay more attention to science and indeed uh, ensures that science becomes the driver of the Nigerian development, uh, not just lip service, but in reality. So that's the attempt of this uh, to ensure that uh, science and policy come close together as the president of the academy is with the president of the country in this picture. Next slide, please. So, um, with the Federal Ministry of Science and Technology, for example, which has been a primary agency of our contact with government, uh, NAS, the, which is the Academy of Science, uh, sits on several boards of the agencies. That has a representative uh, sitting on many boards of the agencies of that uh, of the ministry uh, to help you know drive policy and direction of those agencies, and also has many fellows in several in, in leadership positions in many scientific agencies in the country. But it, 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 some years ago, the ministry actually commissioned the academy as an institution to accredit its agencies. About 18 of them at that time. Uh, to look at all of them and look whether they are fulfilling or achieving the mission for which they were set up and to recommend uh, any changes if, if there is any need for, for that. And that, that's major to drive the development of the country. Uh, in also 2012, the Academy has been involved in developing the National Science, Technology and Innovation Policy. And within that policy, something very important uh, was put in for the first time. Uh, which is to have a national council on STI, which the academy has a member. And the job is to set direction to coordinate STI in, in line with national priorities and also to collate annual reports of achievements of the public STI agencies and facilitate interaction between the research community and government agencies. Next slide, please. Uh, so beyond federal level, the academy actually works at all levels, you know, as long as it can impact on sustainable development in the country, uh, we do what we can. And uh, these are just several examples. Uh, one of the ones I'll just pick on there is the Youth Development and Reproductive Health Project, which we work with Nasarawa and the Kitty States, you know, for over, I mean, about four years, we were working with them on the Grand by Ford Foundation. You know, trying to look at what are the issues with youth development, which includes poverty, which includes unemployment, which includes reproductive health. And like we said, it's looking at the science. So we had to do uh, a baseline study to look at what are the issues and then work with them to develop an action plan uh, with achievable targets, you know, and then help to define how they may do that and drive uh, that as, as state policies uh, that they could pursue towards solving the problem of, uh, of the youth in their states. So just an example, even in the midst of our current challenge of uh, COVID-19, as at 2012, you know, there's a, a tool that is known as the Integrated Disease Surveillance uh, and Response Tool. Uh, which is basically a tool that ensures that you can detect disease outbreak and respond uh, as quickly as possible. And as far back as 2010, actually, was the first meeting we had, but 2012, we had one with all the commissioners of health in Nigeria, uh, pushing for uh, the strengthening of implementation of this IDSR as a tool. Now, it's in doing those kind of things that would have helped us or that has helped us even to be ready uh, for a COVID-19 outbreak years later. Uh, but if we had been even more effective in implementing some of the things that came out of there, we would have had even a better response to COVID-19 in, I mean, in Nigeria today. So, but again, giving us an example of how we leverage on the science to, uh, to achieve the SDGs. So this would deal with the SDGs on health and good health and well-being. Uh, and there we're pushing to say, this is a tool that we need to work on and deal with the challenges of implementation. And just, I mentioned Nasarawa State earlier, this is the governor, or this was the governor of Nasarawa State at the time, uh, giving the president of the academy at the time an award for the uh, projects implemented in that state. Next slide.
Next slide, please. So it looks like uh, that means internet is stuck. Mr. Chairman, I hope I get this injury time. So. <laughs> okay. All right. So I think okay. I'll just move on. And uh, well, oh, by the way, there's some issue with uh, comparing the slides. Maybe because of the project first. Uh, okay. All right. No problem. No problem. I think I have just two more slides after that. And basically, I understand there's only one slide left. Yes. Yeah, so I took one, two. You know. But basically, yes, so that's the second to the last, maybe. Uh, just to show that we had actually also engaged actively with the SDGs office in Nigeria, and the academy is on the National Council on SDGs, which was inaugurated in 2017. Uh, in conclusion, trying to try, tie it down for everyone and hope that you understand it. Um, what I've been trying to say is that you there are no SDGs. You can't get the SDGs achieved without leveraging on scientific evidence. Um, and that science advice is that way that we impute science into policy making, such as an implementation, actually, such as the SDGs. Uh, and I've spoken about the fact that there are many challenges to science advice. However, it is possible to achieve a culture which is what we need to get to effectively a culture of evidence informed policy making. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Odubanjo. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I okay. can. Um, I, can I want to sincerely thank uh, Dr. Odubanjo for given us the science perspective of how to achieve the sustainable development goals. Uh, so to say, we have heard from the left, we have heard from the right. But as far as sustainable development issues are concerned, we don't have left, we don't have right. Maybe we can talk of a little bit to the right and a little bit to the left. Uh, so um, we have about 30 minutes uh, to take questions and to have answers to them. And uh, so we will be inviting our audience as we speak. We are already over 70 in the house. So we'll be ready to ask uh, people to ask questions. And uh, then, uh, OK. So um, yes, we also have questions already. So maybe Femi will, oh, so many of the nine already, but yes. Do we want to take the verbal one or the written ones? Now, um, can I read this? Uh, Professor Buhari, there's a question for you, or maybe a comment from Grace or former. Language develops from the social milieu yeah. And it has been proved that learners do better if taught in the local language. Yeah. This is not so in Nigeria. What do you advise parents and school administrators about this challenge to facilitate learning? In yeah, do you want me to take it now or I'll take it with uh... The lower basic education level. You can take the question now, sir. Prof, you can okay. take the question now. All right. I, I, I think it's very simple. The, the research out there, I, I want to thank Dr. 
Odubajo for the uh, the presentation and the fact that we have to deal with evidence, not opinion, because I have always said that the opinion of an expert is simply an opinion. So it is the evidence that has the credibility, and that when we disagree, we should not disagree. We, should, we can disagree with the scientists, but the evidence is unassailable uh, in terms of it. So the whole idea of interpretation is what where we may differ, but not not necessarily the evidence. The evidence today is that we devalue the capacity of our students, of our children, to embrace and engage the world effectively when we use the language. Okay, I think it's trying to. Questions. Yeah. Maybe we can read more questions together. There are more questions coming in. Okay. Um, so thank you very much, Professor Buhari. There is another question, and I think that's directed to Dr. Banjo, uh, who spoke uh, eloquently on science and policy. And uh, the question is from your experience. Do you consider Nigeria having the human capacity and experience in developing policy frameworks to ensure the intervention proposed after several generations post-colonization? For example, the higher percentage of teachers can hardly instruct in local language. Average Nigerian youth, I guess, does not know the history of the country or his community. Uh, either of you, uh, uh, either Dr. Dubanjo or Professor Bukhari, or both of you can address this. Uh, talking about disconnect with uh, our language and development. Well, maybe, maybe I'll leave the language side to Professor Bukhari, quite obviously. <laughs> but basically to say that we do have the capacity you know, to develop uh, the effective policy uh, that can drive our development. We have that. Um, what has been our real issues, you know, generally has been that we have, after we develop policies, we do not really follow them up. You know, we don't um, continue uh, to monitor, like I said, I mean, to monitor with data uh, and to ensure the, even the sustainability of the policy first you know, before the final outcome, as it were. So very often we get what we have always called the policy somersault. And it's because we have not underpinned all of what we are doing from scratch to finish uh, with, with data. We haven't uh, developed that, that culture, that data respectful culture that ensures that we have to do things based on evidence. And once we do, we can get that. I think the only thing uh, when you start talking about history, and I'm trying to look up that question. You know, um, yeah. Okay, and then the, the, well, it's also the mention of curriculum. And uh, the, the, one of the things I need to change also is our, like we talked about the manu maneuverability of the policymakers. I mentioned that when I was speaking. So when you talk about curriculum, uh, and how fast the society is evolving, we need to be able to change curriculum that fast and adapt it that fast. So, for instance, uh, late last year we were having a meeting in Lagos uh, with some of the leaders, including Professor Bukwala of uh, tertiary institutions, 
looking at artificial intelligence and big data and how that should is influencing uh, the world today and how curriculum needs to change. And one of the identified barriers is that changing curriculum in Nigeria is such a big deal. It takes so long and so much for you to get uh, curriculum to change. So that, that flexibility, uh, we need to evolve that flexibility. Policymakers need to evolve that flexibility to realize that we're dealing with a fast changing society. Thank you. Um, Professor Foma, you've been raising your hand for quite some time. We've just unmuted you. Can you go ahead to speak, ma? Professor Foma. Okay. I'm not sure we are hearing you very well now. Oh, it's, it's a little bit more people now. Maybe I'll just kindly request that you type the questions and they would respond. Okay, so there are a few more questions here. Um, I think this is for Professor Ebuare. Someone said that he's been helping to translate COVID-19 information from English to Yoruba for Wikipedia. And I see it's been a nice and fulfilling experience, but uh, it appears not everyone has, has access to Wikipedia, especially in rural communities where they divide. So how best do we get local communities involved? In, even if we have the information translated, live with social and physical distancing for some time more. Well, that's for you, sir. Yeah, okay. The basic thing is that the most viable means to reach rural areas is the radio. So after, after uh, translating, you should create an audio map and then get them broadcast on radio or simply pro provide them uh, in, in uh, ways in which all the audio materials can be, can be accessed through the mobile phone. So we need to know that the rural communities can be, can be reached effectively through, through radio, through the radio medium. And that is the most uh, effective uh, way to reach them. Uh, the Wikipedia is good there. It's a kind of, uh, when you put information on the internet so far in Nigeria because of the uh, very poor rural penetration and the problem of illiteracy, uh, whatever you do on Wikipedia or on the internet is, is uh, rather pedantic. But if you want it to influence behavior in any way, you must put it in, in a medium that reaches the people. And then, of course, one of the uh, devices that we are not even using a lot here is that we, we have all these uh, portable radios for about 2,000 to 3,000 that can take the, uh, what do you call it, uh, these uh, uh, storage devices and they use, uh, uh, what, what do you call it, uh, these uh, uh, cards, uh, you know, that you can, the memory cards. We also should try to start to learn to explore those issues. That we, must, we can do a lot when we use technology, adaptable technology. Technology must not be looked at only in terms of uh, what trends. Adaptation is what leads to sustainable technology. So sustainability also is in the whole uh, in the area of technology. So if you reach by radio, you reach by memory, memory card, you reach by storage devices, you put your information in those means, the rural people will get it. And these radios are so small. I have one myself, which I, I plan to use for my students. It's just, it's, a, it's less than, it's about 3,000 Naira. And you put a, a storage device, you attach it, attach it to it, it will play your music, it will play your audio files. So these are issues uh, at the areas where we can actually reach uh, uh, our people with information. We can reach the rural areas with information. We must not always wait for the expensive solution. And if I may, if I may just uh, the, the, the idea that uh, we, are, we, we have capacity, we don't have capacity. I want to also agree with uh, uh, Dr. Udubanjo that actually we have capacity. 
we have capacity in the sense that through technology today, with one expert located somewhere in Nigeria, like in Lagos or wherever, you can reach hundreds of thousands of people with quality content where the other uh, individuals themselves can now serve as those who are uh, the, 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 the facilitators of such a quality content. So we must not use that as, an, as a reason now why things cannot be done. Things can be done with what we have. Our model of uh, solution solving problems is itself not sustainable. That's one of the big problems we have. We need to use sustainable approaches to problem solution if we really actually are not looking at Thank you so much, sir. Oh, thank you so much for that, sir. Right. Uh, there, are two, there are two questions for Dr. Dubanjo. Does Nigeria Academy of Science have a catalog of research outputs? If yes, how can one access it? And the second is this, that what is the relationship between SDGs and universal health coverage of 2030? Uh, well, okay, so the catalog of research output, no, we don't have that yet. Um, we kept also looking at other stakeholders who were trying to do the same thing at a point in time that we wanted to do that. Uh, but And we didn't want to duplicate the effort. However, I think it's become clearer to us that they are not able to do what they said they would do. So it's one of the projects that's in the pipeline now. Um, we, whereby we'll have that online. And one of the questions, I mean, one of the critical things to consider is how do you assess, um, do you need to kind of filter what gets on or not? You know, can people just put in whatever they want? So we're working on, on it anyway, that's what I'm trying to say. And uh, when it's there, it will be open access. Most all our products are open access. People can get them freely, whether it's hard copy, whether it's online, and uh, when we do that, also we expect it will be open and, uh, and everybody can access it because that's when it can actually impact the society. You know, um, second one is um, the SDGs and the universal health coverage. Well, the, the basically they are they are, they are more or like less speaking about the same thing. Universal health coverage talks about uh, getting quality health care, making quality health care accessible and affordable to all, you know, equitably, you know, and that's basically your SDG that talks about uh, health and well-being. You know, so they are, they are basically the same. Everybody's using different languages here and there uh, in the policy documents and calling them different things. But uh, if you achieve universal health coverage, it will be one of the major things or major steps towards achieving uh, good health and well-being. Thank you. Do we have more questions on the floor? I think there's a hand raised. Okay, so someone has asked a question and that's directed to Professor Egwari. It says, what's the missing link between policy formulation and implementation in Nigeria? 
how can we influence health politics among amidst all other sectors in Nigeria? Oh, okay, uh, missing link between uh, policy formulation and uh, uh, implementation. There are two things. I think one, Dr. Odubanjo has raised, is the problem of evidence. Uh, the, the policies are usually sometimes not based on hard evidence, scientific evidence. You know, it doesn't matter whether you are, you are dealing with the humanities or not. Uh, evidence, scientific evidence is scientific evidence. Uh, the other thing basically is that even when the policies have been crafted, uh, in such a way, the implementation is uh, so far from the problem of the implementation time frame. In which case, for instance, you discover that when a policy has been form formulated, uh, the, 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 uh, the period for implementation is so short because of the rapidity of, uh, of turnover of policy implement implementers. There is two excessive turnovers that we have in the sector. And then every, every new entrant into the area wants to start its own, its own phase. And so you don't have, so that means basically that, uh, I think the same thing basically that means that uh, we don't have basically the, uh, the system, the institutions and the processes to ensure that policies are realized. So policies look like uh, 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 simply political strategies uh, 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 that people devise in order to either win, it, uh, win an election or get into a position. So there is no commitment you know, on, the, on the part of the population. And part of the reason why you don't have the commit commitment also is that there are no buy-in by those who are the end users of the policy because they are never involved. It's a top bottom, top to bot uh, bottom uh, approach to policy. And uh, if you do that, then of course you know there will be no no ways of monitoring and evaluating and ensuring that there is a sustainability in, uh, in uh, the delivery of the uh, policy. Well, thank you very much, uh, there is Another question here is a bit uh, confusing, but is asking about open data, whether they are accessible to use in SDGs. Um, yeah, whether open data is accessible for use in SDGs. Uh, also talking about critical partial data. I'm wondering whether such a, uh, exists in Nigeria. There's, there's a question here for Professor Eguare. Would a child thought in Yoruba, Igbo, or Hausa in Nigeria be able to collaborate with other researchers in New Zealand, South America, or Asia to solve some of the world's biggest problems? Can such a person operate globally? And this is against the background of the fact that um, it's advocated that Nigerians should be taught using indigenous languages. So the person is wondering. Yes, yeah, there is no, the, the, the whole business of being taught with an indigenous language is not uh, mutually exclusive from acquiring uh, uh, an, an international language. Uh, so uh, there is still room for multiculturalism, multilingualism, uh, and uh, the, 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 the more the number of languages that a child uh, acquires, the better for the child. Uh, it's been shown scientifically also that it's, it's good for the child's uh, psychological, psychological well-being, it's good for its capacity to learn, for its understanding of the world. And uh, what we're saying basically is that there must be a synchrony between the, 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 the medium of learning and the reality before the child. Um, uh, and that when you teach a child in the language that he or she understands best, the language of the environment, learning is, uh, is, uh, is, is easier to, uh, to, uh, to attain. And that's basically the, the, the idea. So the Nigerian policy, for instance, does not say that the child should not learn 
in an international language. So they are, they are, they are, they, 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 English is basically already uh, 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 serving that purpose. Uh, we can add other languages because an average child can take as many language, languages as, as possible. You can add Arabic, you can add uh, French, you can add German. It basic, basically, at infancy, a child can take as many as four or five languages without any problem at all. It's not a weight at all. It's not, it's not a problem at all. It's only for those of us who are already formed <laughs> in, our, in our ways at our age. Uh, you can break our heads and try to, and try to start something and it will not stay there. So I think basically what we should do is that we should promote uh, a, a system where we expose our children, uh, the young ones, to as many languages as possible while they are growing up. So, they, 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 so they, in conclusion, yes, it's uh, possible to have a, a link and interaction with the people all over the world with the wife teaching a foreign language. And the other thing basically is that you will be sure to understand that even the, the learning of the local language itself boosts the capacity to learn the international language, other languages. So in, in terms of learning of English, uh, Yoruba does not prevent you from learning good English. So if you learn Yoruba, it only makes you a better human being, a uh, better learner, and then of course a, a more uh, grounded uh, personality, confident about your reality and about your world. Can you hear me, Dr. Yes, I can. Yes. Um, I... Oh, I can't hear you anymore, sir. I can't hear you either. Yeah. It's breaking, sir. Now it's off. Okay. Hello, sir. Yes. C can you hear me very well, sir? What Prof was saying is, can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can. Okay, what Prof was saying is that Chinese um, appear to have mastered just their language, Mandarin, and yet they compete, they collaborate um, to advance the frontiers of science. That so, um, nothing should stop Nigerians who learn particularly uh, an indigenous language from collaborating. So, he just wanted it to. Well, okay. Uh, commenting on that, but I think it's more suited for Professor Ebu Kari. But so, commenting on that, I think it's, um, it's absolutely correct. Uh, but I think one of the problems we have had is we don't have self confidence, you know, to look within to begin to deal with our issues and solve our problems ourselves, which is what the Chinese have done actually, uh, just as much as the Indians, is that they've looked within to say they have the capacity, like we were saying earlier, uh, to deal with issues. Uh, they can borrow knowledge here and there, but the, and, and that begins with even uh, language and all of that to say, look, we can deal with some of these things and solve them ourselves. And if we're good enough, uh, then people will, people will be forced to find a way to collaborate. Uh, and that is what is happening. So once they can do things and they're producing everything everybody needs, uh, not just that they are able to collaborate with other people, it's, it's a matter of fact that everybody is looking to collaborate with them. You know, so if you pick up a phone, uh, be it an, an American phone or whatever, uh, almost all, half of the components are made in China. Uh, and all of us. So the capacity they have developed forces the world to collaborate with them. And that, that is the way we should think about things, is that if we can indeed uh, develop ourselves and focus internally to solve problems, and that, for example, taking the COVID-19 situation is one of our own positions uh, with the government, is to say you need to look inwards. Don't wait for the answers and solutions to come from outside but you need to look inwards because you have answers within. 
And this is an equal opportunity disease, for instance, that tells you that everybody is running looking for answers. Nobody had the answer ready made. So, so don't wait for them to bring it. You might as well be the one to provide the answer. You know, and that's the kind of approach we should take to all the issues we're dealing with. Thank you. We can hear you, sir. I think it might, it might work better without the earpiece. Maybe the the wire of the earpiece is uh, if you unplug it from the computer completely. No, not yet. Sir. It, maybe if you unplug it. No, sir. I'm I'm reading your lips, just <laughs> so you know. <laughs> Professor Diaka, can you please help us do a wrap up of the presentations so far? Okay, thank you very much and good afternoon to every one of you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Doc, for the words that you've given to us this afternoon. Um, they have tried to give us information and serious insight into how we can achieve the SDGs in Nigeria, first through the humanities and how we can also use science to do the best we can in Nigeria. Now, the first talk we had was actually achieving the SDG in Nigeria through the humanities. And Prof gave us three conceptual issues that he seriously explained. I don't need to go into that. But one basic thing that he told us off was that sustainable development is living with the future in mind. And we all know that humanities deals with the academic disciplines that study human society and culture. Now, he also explained to us that sustainable development is sustaining the human life. It also talks about communication, that sustainable development is also communication, particularly with our language, which has become actually one of the biggest genocide today. How far have we gone with the languages that we have that we can easily communicate with? He also made it clear to us that language and culture has become a big challenge to sustainability. And knowing fully well from what he told us anyway, the language and culture are the basis of creativity and innovation. And if you look at the sustainable development goals, and if you're talking about sustainability or development, you discover that for us to be able to create, for us to be able to bring out innovation, that means we need our languages. That means we need our culture, without which it becomes really difficult for us, you know, to attain the sustainable development. Again, he said so much about our lifestyle in relation to the importance of sustainable development as regards our nation, Nigeria. Well, he emphasized these two major problems. That is the cultural and linguistic diversity. 
um, where he spoke a little bit about the lingua franca that we're supposed to have. But one basic fact we should take away from here is that the culture and language are actually central to sustainable development. And I hope we got that clear. He also made it clear to us that there's some norms that we have. I remember in my own area too, you dare not use a broom to sweep on top of a table where someone is eating. They see it as a taboo, but I think there's a scientific basis behind it. The fact that if you use the broom you use in sweeping the floor to sweep the table or clear the table, diseases and all that would be there. So it's high time we began looking at what we have and not to continue in what we're not too sure of. That he made so clear. And I want to thank Prof for that enlightenment. Uh, in the second part, Doc told us about leveraging scientific evidence to achieve the SDGs in Nigeria. Uh, Dr. Odubanjo actually told us that scientific evidence is needed, that we all know, that we are sure of. We also need scientific advice in support of the successful delivery of the global uh, goals by 2030. We can't run away from that. The truth is that government needs this evidence-based research for their policy uh, formulation. And actually, they are more likely to make better choices when they use this well-developed evidences. However, he made us to understand that science alone does not make policy. I think I have to stress that that science alone does not make policy. There are many values and political considerations that are involved in policy making. And I think from what Prof said initially, this is where humanity is also coming. We cannot stand alone as scientists. Government cannot stand alone. The humanities also cannot stand alone. So we need each other to achieve sustainable development. We need the scientists to give the science advice and to policy. And we expect the science advice to be used by government. But one major thing he talked about is that the government don't ask us. There's a kind of fire brigade that comes when they need these ideas or when they need advice or when policies are to be made. So if we as scientists don't have evidence-based research information to give, we may not be available. We may not be able to help out. The development that we're looking for may not be there. So in essence, he's talking about we having development in our minds when we are talking about research. We don't do research in our universities, in our research institutes, just because we want to have promotions. Enough of that, he said. We should be able to look at development in any research that we are going into. And I hope that this has actually gone down well with us. Because these policymakers, they have limited bandwidth. And of course, they want to maneuver their way almost immediately. So we always must be ready. The scientists must be ready. We know that scientists are very good at problem definition. We know they are good in bringing out solutions. But sometimes the way we also bring it or put it across to government becomes an issue. Sometimes there's a little bit of pride in us as scientists, you know, bringing out this information. And of course, policymakers who are politicians may not want to listen to you when you come with that kind of idea. However, in policy making, policy is really determined by what we refer to as the evidence. And these policy makers use this information the way they want it. So we must be ready. We must have what we think it is real, not fake information for them to have a serious uh, evidence on hand to bring out good policies that will help our development. Um, 
In conclusion, if I will round up with that, the truth from what the speaker said is that there will not be any sustainable development goals without leveraging on scientific evidence. Secondly, science advice is the imputing of science into policy making, which to me I feel is very necessary. And government is relying on us, the policy makers, they are relying on us and we need to prove our worth. Thank God that when it comes to SDGs or SDSN, members of the SDSN network are mainly from the universities and much is expected from us. Also to achieve the SDGs, like Prof said initially, we need to begin to bring in our culture, to bring in our language, which to us we have seen this afternoon that they are actually central to sustainable development. Do we really want to achieve? Do we really want to make headway? Do we really want to be part of the 2030, 2030 agenda fulfilling what the global expects from us? Then we have to look into that. Knowing fully well that language and culture are the basis of creativity and innovation. Of course then, science, humanities, government should work together to achieve this. Our lifestyle is important in sustainable development. Our lifestyle is absolutely important in sustainable development. And I hope and pray that in all these challenges, in all these issues, in all these science advice and all that we are talking about with policy making, hopefully the universities will come up with something positive for governments to use in policy formulation. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much, Doc. We are really very grateful. Thank you. And that's all that I have for now. God bless you. Over to you, Femi. Did you hear me? Yes, we heard you, but we okay. can't hear we can't hear that body. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. 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 So I just want to add to the appreciation of our presenters, uh, Dr. Professor Dwight. Uh, you've done very well, and uh, we hope on the front of you in the future. We will accept our invitation. Uh, we are all in it together. Development is about all of us, and it is with all of us. And we have a duty to humanity. To it's gone off of nothing. Prof, you're off again. Amen. The next one is. I don't know. Oh. Okay, Prof, he was just rounding. He was just rounding off his message and greeting everyone, thanking you for participating. So he was thanking Professor Barry, was thanking Dr. Odubanjo, and for the attendees, thank you for um, participating in our webinar today. We appreciate you. So thank you, everyone. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you, Dr. Odubanjo. Thank you, Professor Barry. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, yeah, go around.